Hello, I'm Surya Pierce. While apparently straightforward, diagnosing hypothyroidism has been the subject of some interesting controversies that the primary care physician should be aware of. The following presentation will explore some of the facts and uncertainties of diagnosing hypothyroidism, as well as suggesting an integrative approach to the patient with suspected hypothyroidism. This will also serve as a supplement to our integrative teaching module on the integrative treatment of hypothyroidism. It doesn't take more than a Google search to pull up an array of popular books and websites expressing controversial and alternative views of hypothyroidism. Additionally, many patients with hypothyroidism find their experience of the disease at odds with the conventional approach to diagnosis and treatment. The resultant frustration and dissatisfaction may be particularly apparent in an integrative practice, which often draws people who, for various reasons, feel estranged or mistrusting of conventional medicine. Discussing in a non-judgmental fashion such alternative views and sources of information can help navigate what might otherwise become a challenging encounter for a conventionally trained provider. Addressing what is known and what is uncertain about hypothyroidism is another helpful approach, which leads us to the facts and uncertainties. As we'll see, much of the thyroid controversy in the popular media seems to stem from a similar controversy in the medical community over the normal range of TSHs. Fact number one. In 2003, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, or the AACE, recommended normal TSH values be changed to 0.3 to 3.0 micro-international units per liter. This seems straightforward, right? These are the experts, and when they got together, they came up with the best answer, right? Well, not exactly, which leads us to uncertainty number one. It is actually controversial what the best normal range of TSH should be. The AACE had actually changed the normal TSH value in 2003, making it narrower. So why did they do that? Previous normal values had usually been more like 0.5 to 5.5 before the 2003 guidelines. It turns out in the year before, in 2002, the National Academy of Clinical Biochemists had recommended TSH values be narrowed even more to 0.4 to 2.5 micro-international units per liter. This NACB, or the biochemist recommendation, was established from the 95th percentile confidence limits of rigorously screened normal individuals. It seemed that the endocrinologists agreed with the biochemists but didn't want such radical numbers, so they recommended a more modest change to 0.3 to 3.0 in 2003. This guideline, however, was subsequently challenged when a group of researchers published an article in JAMA uh, showing that 20% of their tertiary care patients would qualify as having, quote, biochemical hypothyroidism if the upper limit of TSH uh, had been changed to 3.0. Meanwhile, in practice, clinical labs were understandably reluctant to change their normal values at all. Many labs, including my own, now set its normal range of TSH with supposedly rigorously screened euthyroid individuals of our local population. But in the case of my lab, the uh, normal range is consistently different than these prior consensus recommendations. What is the normal range of TSH at your lab? You might find out and compare it to these guidelines. Fact number two. Subclinical hyperthyroidism and subclinical hypothyroidism exhibit TSH values beyond normal and in the presence of normal serum-free T3 and T4. 
So this was also a 2003 AACE guideline. They actually tweaked the numbers a little bit and said a TSH of less than 0.1 micro international units per liter for subclinical hyperthyroidism and greater than 5.0 for subclinical hypothyroidism. This seems pretty straightforward, right? If, if your patient's TSH is a little bit out of whack and your T3 and T4 are normal, they might have early or subclinical disease. Strangely, however, the AACE guidelines acknowledge that these subclinical thyroid states may be present in the absence or presence of symptoms. In other words, even though it's subclinical, it doesn't matter whether they have symptoms or not. This sounds a bit strange to say that something is subclinical both with and without symptoms, which leads us to uncertainty number two. It is actually unclear who in these subclinical diagnoses will benefit from treatment. These are actually relatively new and somewhat controversial diagnoses. There wasn't really a consensus about their existence before the 2003 guidelines, and to this day they still remain somewhat controversial amongst endocrinologists. A big challenge here is that while some research suggests a clear benefit to treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism in terms of lipid control and cardiovascular effects, others show no or minimal benefit on these same measures. And then there is the old issue of heterogeneity of normal TSH ranges utilized by these studies. If you can't agree on a normal range, how can you agree on defining a disease state? One might ask, if we were going to have very irregular normal ranges of TSH, but we are going to define subclinical states based on these supposedly abnormal TSHs, which might benefit from treatment, wouldn't it be better to just define abnormal thyroid function and treatment based primarily on symptoms, which is what really matters to patients anyway? This is precisely what many alternative practitioners are advocating. But let's get back to the facts. Fact number three. The normal values of TSH are based on the 95th percent confidence interval, or about two standard deviations from the mean. Simple concept, right? This is basic statistics. You take the population of normal euthyroid individuals and the outlying 5% get defined as abnormal. If this is so easy, then why is obtaining a consensus about normal TSH is so difficult? Which leads us to uncertainty number three. The distribution of normal TSH is a rightward skewed curve, not a classic bell-shaped curve. This observation appears in many samples of many published papers, and there are two major explanations why. Some suggest that this skewed curve is a byproduct of including certain abnormal individuals in the sampling of quote-unquote normals. This is shown in the figure A here. Inclusion of abnormal hypothyroid patients in a normal distribution, represented by the dotted line, could skew a normal distribution, which here is represented as the true normal in a solid line. Another explanation is that distinct subpopulations actually have a different normal range, which are inappropriately lumped together. So in graph B, we see there are two different populations with normal ranges that each form a bell-shaped curve, and when they're superimposed on each other, you get a right-skewed distribution. The second explanation of the right skew of the normal distribution of TSHs is substantiated in this graph. This is uh, based on data from the NHANES-3 study, that's the National Health and Nutrition Examination Study, which was a, a large survey study. 
And this graph splits up populations by age. Each individual curve looks more like a normal bell-shaped distribution, but again, when they're superimposed on each other, they form a right skew. The differences in normal TSHs between race and also between sexes have also been demonstrated from this NHANES data. This figure shows well how different subpopulations probably have different normal ranges of TSHs, and so some are arguing that we need to be defining normal TSHs by specific subpopulations. So all of this is a bit frustrating, isn't it? And if it's frustrating for us as clinicians, it must be more so for patients. So where do we go from here? Many clinicians and patients argue that thyroid function is too critical and too complex to define dysfunction solely based on an established normal values of TSH. Doing so, they argue, neglects the continuum of thyroid function, demand, and individual difference. There seems to be some truth to this view. While on the one hand, we don't want to define a disease state that would label 20% of the population as abnormal, we also don't want to withhold proper treatment of potentially reversible disease states. There's certainly a lot that we don't know. At the end of the day, I think that it's relatively non-controversial to say that the diagnosis of hypothyroidism should be based on a combination of both objective measures, for example, a normal TSH, and subjective measures, symptoms and clinical context. We should remember as clinicians that while most patients with hypothyroidism have an abnormal TSH, whatever that may be, some will have a nearly normal TSH. Additionally, some patients will have an abnormal TSH and not have symptoms, and these patients will probably not benefit from treatment. The bottom line is that one size may not fit all when diagnosing hypothyroidism.